Let's talk about just-in-time compilation. I am a teacher by trade currently, and whenever I teach a new class, sometimes it gets a little scary because I don't have the lesson materials planned as far as head and those kind of things. Confessions of a teacher here. And so I'll spend the night before prepping the lesson or getting materials, assignments ready to go, that kind of thing. And we call that just-in-time teaching. The lesson and the lab is ready just in time for the the uh, the class to start the very next day. So there you go, confessions of a teacher. Just-in-time compiling works pretty much the exact same way. .NET compiles your code just in time right before you decide to execute it. Let me see if I can give you an example here. I'm going to say class, another class, and in here we'll say public, static, void, moo, and in here we'll just do the typical moo like so and then down here in main I'm gonna say hey another class dot moo control L control V V paste it twice and uh, you see we call moo once we call moo twice now what happens is the just-in-time compiler when it compiles your code it compiles it method by method as you call those methods so if there are methods in your code let's just make another one here void whatever Okay, if there's methods in your code that are never called upon, they will never be just in time compiled to the native instructions. Now, what do I mean by that? We've seen that in previous videos in this playlist, but allow me to demonstrate one more time. We have a C sharp code file here, this main class dot CS. When we hit Control Shift B or on the command line when I write CSC, either one executes CSC or C sharp compiler upon our CS file, and that turns it into Microsoft Intermediate Intermediate sorry that's an Intermediate language, which we've seen a lot of. It's it's very readable. Very, we've disassembled it. It's it's very high level language still. It's not as high as C sharp. But it's not as low as native assembly language. If we if we run our code though, the just in time compiler or the JIT as we call it will method by method, as we call those methods, compile those uh, instructions down to native instructions, which the CPU, a very dumb but very fast machine, the 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 CPU, it, it it can follow those instructions and ex execute them accordingly. So if we don't if we don't call a method, the just in time compiler won't compile it. This is also done at runtime. Okay, and, and so when I call moo here for the first time, the just in time compiler will kick in and say, oh, there's a a moo call here. I better go up here and and compile all this code to native instructions. And so we get bits and bytes and that sort of thing out of that. And, and then the next time I call Moo, the just-in-time compiler will say, well, I did that work. I saved away that code out in RAM, so I no longer need to to compile this again. And and so what happens is we don't even go to the just-in-time compiler. We just execute the, the native instructions that are sitting in memory. So it's kind of like we're creating code at runtime, even though the definitions for those codes were created at at our compile time, this compile time, but at runtime, the just-in-time compiler will compile this method. And so yes, there's a little bit of a hit on that first call to the just-in-time compiler, but generally I find that most of my code executes the same methods over and over and over and over again. So if I just run the program once, yeah, the first executions I, I eat that hit, but then after that my code runs just fine. And to be honest, I don't even notice this hit. That, the compilation time is, is, is very fast. Okay, I want to prove to you that the compiler is actually, the just-in-time compiler is actually creating this at runtime. Let, let, let this, let's execute this, but first of all, uh, the just-in-time compiler associates, when it compiles this code, it associates that dynamic code with the type object in memory, and so I'm going to do a trick here. Type T gets type of another class. And I'm not absolutely perfect on the details of how it maps the moo calls to the actual dynamic code, but let me let me show you a trick I kind of bumped into here uh, accidentally. 
Uh, let me ignore this for now. We're going to use that very quickly. I'm going to say type T gets type of another class. And EAX is a register, a native register on my CPU. And I just know by examining the code here, if I hit Control-Alt-D, we can actually see the native instructions. These are the native instructions. These are not missile instructions. This is native to the CPU. I was messing around before this video, and I saw, hey, you know what? When this is done... EAX, this EAX 32-bit register, has the address of the type object I'm trying to access. Let me close that again. So EAX essentially is T's reference in a way. So let me grab that value here, and I'm going to say, you know what, let's go inspect that memory that that, that type object's sitting out at. And if you want to go watch the reflection videos, I highly suggest it. It will help you understand what type objects are, but you don't necessarily need to understand that for this video. 0x for hex, let me paste the value I just copied out of EAX, I pasted it right here. Hit enter, and sure enough the memory window takes us out there and says, this is the type object, and and anyway, I, I don't want to get into all this right now, but watch what happens. I'm going to call moo, and don't blink. Okay, watch, I'm going to hit F10. Did you see that? We have our moo here. Okay, you can see the actual dynamic string. Remember, I didn't instantiate, well, I guess I, this does instantiate it, but this is just a hard-coded string inside of our code. And so when we execute move for the first time, it says, oh, I better I better just-in-time compile it. So the code, you can see the code is placed out here again. Now when I run moo again, it doesn't need to do that again because all the, the code has been just-in-time compiled. It's already there. No need to compile it again. So... So it'll run that. But I want to prove to you that we're actually going to execute. This is code. I know it's memory, but it's code inside of memory kind of thing. I want to prove to you that this is the code that's actually executed. So I'm going to come down here to this. I don't know. Let's, let's mess around with this memory. I'm going to change this to a J. And we'll change this one to an A. And this one to an M. Oh, that's kind of... It's going back and forth. I wish it wouldn't do that, but there you go. There's J A M I E. Remember, characters in .NET are two bytes wide, and these are each a byte. So there's Jamie. Let's run Moo again. Let me just bring the output here. You can see it said Moo before, but now I'm gonna I'm gonna hit F10 here, and look at that. What printed? Jamie. <laughs> Followed by three O's. There's three O's right here. So there you go. This is the dynamic code, or part of the dynamic code that the just-in-time compiler uh, created at runtime. And then I went as far as saying, you know what? I'm going to change the J-A-M-I-E right there. Now, that, I, I just have to throw out something here, string interning and that kind of thing, but I'm, I'm going to leave it at that. But you can see, yes, yes, it's, it's just-in-time compiled.